is a rather different kind of Hyundai i20. This third generation version has changed in terms of style and sophistication, with mild hybrid engine tech and the kind of media and safety features you'd usually expect to find on a much larger car. At the same time though, quite a few recognisably sensible character traits from previous models still remain. It's now reasonable these days to expect much more of a Super Mini, and in many respects, this car can now really deliver on that brief. Hyundai might have established itself as a sensible budget brand, but these days the company has much higher aspirations than that. Even its most sensible models now have more than a modicum of style, technology and just a bit of a want one factor. For proof of that, check out this one, the brand's third generation i20 Super Mini. There's no getting away from it. In its previous two PB and GB series incarnations, uh, respectively launched in 2009 and 2015, the i20 was rather dull. There is certainly a market for that, as evidenced by the fact that over 100,000 examples of the second generation version were sold in Europe, and even more than that in India, which is this car's biggest market. Customers here, though, tend to require a little more character from their Super Mini selection, something it was going to take more than an expensive World Rally Championship program for the old Mark II model to deliver. This replacement BC3 series design, though, just might. As you can see, there's a much sharper look and you get a more spacious cabin. Plus, all the volume variants have 48 volt mild hybrid engine tech too. In addition, mindful of the fact that almost half of all sales of its larger i30 family hatch are of seriously sporty variants, Hyundai has gone all out to make sure those bases are covered here. N-line models offer a warm hatch vibe and at the top of the range, there is now a full fat i20N shopping rocket version that goes gunning for the Fiesta ST. On top of that, there's a clever new intelligent manual transmission system, stronger standards of safety and big car style media provision. All good, you'd think, but prices have risen too and the segment competition is fierce. Is this i20 at last ready to face it head on? Let's find out. A customer looking at a mainstream i20 isn't likely to be someone seduced by the joy of driving. Typical owners of previous generation versions of this car usually chose it because they liked the economy, the warranty, and if we're being totally honest, because it was pretty cheap. Well, it isn't particularly inexpensive anymore, but those other attributes still apply, as does another which has previously helped this Hyundai Ghana sales, the fact it's so easy to operate and drive. Not that it feels that way when you try to start it. With the manual model most will want, you need both the clutch and the brake pressed and the gear lever in neutral before the engine will fire, which is a bit of a fag. But the little one litre TGDI petrol unit that you have to have in mainstream models springs into life with a cheerful three cylinder thrum. And as you set off, uh, you begin to realize just why an older or a first time driver will probably really like one of these. For a start, everything is so light and easy to use, primarily the electric steering, but also if you've opted for this stick shift, uh, the clutch and the gear shift action too. Even better, this car is easier to see out of front and rear than just about any super mini that we can think of, which of course makes things simple in the city and perfect for parking. But Hyundai isn't going to increase its market share of the small hatch segment just by making a Super Mini primarily appeal to early drivers and to the elderly. Uh, the brand created a World Rally Championship version of the previous generation i20 model to prove that it could do more. And this third generation design needs to start delivering dynamically if the established players in the class are going to start feeling at all threatened by this Korean contender. Which is a bit of an ask because once you delve down into the fine print, you discover that essentially the oily bits being served up by this Mark III model aren't really that much different from those used by its terminally dull predecessor. Still, the carryover chassis has been stiffened. Uh, there has been a marginal 4% weight reduction 
and the core one litre engine has been given electrified mild hybrid tech that's supposed to deliver slight mid-range overtaking boost. Drive modes are now standard too, accompanied by multicoloured changes on the freshly added digital supervision cluster instrument binnacle screen in front of you. Uh, turquoise for eco, white for comfort and red for sport. Eco is the default every time you start, which is slightly annoying because it rather unhelpfully desensitises the accelerator pedal until you remember to change the setting to one that responds a bit faster, uh, sport mode particularly so. Hyundai hasn't told us very much about the suspensional changes, but there must have been some because the ride feels a bit firmer than the previous generation model, and that's the move which makes the car more susceptible to poorer tarmac tears, and so it won't be well received by the kind of undemanding owners that we referenced earlier on. That plays its part though in helping the car change direction at speed and cling on through tight corners. Uh, what Hyundai's engineers need to learn though is the art of producing a small car with a decent ride and handling balance, uh, the kind of benchmark which is currently set in this segment by the Ford Fiesta and by the Volkswagen Polo. There are some things that those brands could learn from here though. Uh, take the clever IMT, intelligent manual transmission that the Korean maker has developed for this Mark III model. It uh, decouples the engine from the gearbox after the driver releases the accelerator pedal. Uh, this allows the car to enter into two possible levels of coasting uh, depending on the conditions. The first uh, leaves the engine idling and the second turns it off completely. Uh, take your foot off the throttle for a prolonged period of time and you'll hear the revs cut and that means the IMT is doing its thing. Uh, the moment that your foot reconnects with the accelerator of course uh, the engine will spring back into life. The alternative transmission offering is Hyundai's usual 7DCT dual clutch automatic. Let's talk more about that electrified engine we mentioned earlier on. As we said, there's only one for mainstream customers, but it comes with a choice of uh, two outputs, and it's been lightly embellished with the brand's 48-volt mild hybrid tech. We would like to have seen Hyundai offer the full hybrid 1.6-litre unit it provides on its alternative Kona SUV, which allows independent drive purely on battery power and therefore much greater gains in efficiency. Uh, this mild hybrid power plant can't do anything like that. Uh, there is a fraction more mid-range throttle response and the start-stop system cuts in a bit earlier at urban speeds. Uh, that's about it though. Still, Hyundai wants to convince you that this tech is making a discernible difference and to that end they've provided a selectable energy flow screen in the instrument cluster so you can see how the system's working. We mentioned a couple of outputs for this 1 litre TGDI unit. Nearly all i20 folk are going to be happy with this engine in its base 100 PS form that we're trying here. Uh, in manual form that makes 62 from rest in 10.4 seconds en route to 117 miles an hour. It's 11.4 seconds and 113 miles an hour for the auto. Opting for sportier N-line trim uh, means that non-negotiably you have to have this unit in its uprated 120 PS state of tune. That makes virtually no discernible difference to the performance of the manual model. The 62 miles an hour sprint time is reduced by 3 tenths to 10.1 seconds, but it takes over a second off the time of the auto. It reduces it to 10.3 seconds. All of this is delivered to the accompaniment of a characteristically thrummy soundtrack which settles down very nicely at a cruise, although not by enough to allow refinement to rival, say, a Polo or a Peugeot 208. We're going to finish this section with a few words on a variant that will be of absolutely no interest to a typical mainstream i20 customer, the wild in-your-face i20N super hatch variant, which we'll cover properly, of course, in a separate film. Uh, here there's a 1.6 litre four-cylinder turbo petrol power plant, which develops 204 PS and 275 newton meters of torque, pretty much what you'll get from a rival Ford Fiesta ST. The i20N's performance figures near replicate those of the Ford 2. Rest to 62 in 6.7 seconds, the ST is 6.5, on the way to 143 miles an hour. There's also firmer suspension with uprated springs, dampers and roll bars, plus launch control for Grand Prix style getaways. And there's more via blue buttons on the steering wheel. You can choose from a range of dynamic preset drive modes. 
or you can select your own preferred settings from the cheesily named N Grin Control System. Uh, there are three each for engine response, steering weight, ESC intervention, and the rev matching function. Plus, you can also alter the bassy note of the big bore exhaust. Uh, you can imagine an owner of a more typical i20 feeling all this to be rather silly though but it does at least prove that Hyundai is serious about more sophisticated engineering for this i20. A decent step forward has been made in that regard with this third generation model, but a bigger step still will be required next time round if the brand is to achieve absolute class honors. Don't bet against that happening. Hyundai is clearly on a mission to banish dull design from its product portfolio. We've already seen that in recent times from the Tucson and the Ionic 5, and the point is emphasized here again by a third generation i20, which looks nothing like either of its predecessors and is all the better for it. Now, this was the first car in Europe to feature the brand's current sensuous sportiness design language. Uh, that's a moniker which uh, probably sounds rather better in Korean, but it certainly translates better in the metal. Particularly here in profile, a perspective which delivers this wedge-shaped look, complete with slashes, contrasting colour, and this rather unique swept-up design around the C and D pillars. Uh, three sharp crease lines bring light and shade to the paintwork, uh, a lower one that flows up from the seals, a higher one above the door handles, and also this third shorter one that gives character to the rear haunches. The car is dimensionally different too. There is a slight 5mm increase in length over the previous generation model, but the main change is a 24mm reduction in roof height, which gives the silhouette a more dynamic and sportier vibe. Uh, that's something that's emphasised by larger wheels, 16-inch uh, alloys as a starting point, but 17-inch rims like these ones are more commonly fitted, along with 18 inches further up the range. The front end too is all about angles and attitude. Uh, the black grille is a great deal more overt than before and on most variants uh, it now gets flanked by these piercing LED headlights with upper sections framed by tick-shaped daytime running light strips. Uh, this more sharply creased bumper incorporates uh, triangular corner cutouts for these fog lamps. There is a black lower spoiler lip of the kind that you might find on a sporty hatch. And the bonnet now has two prominent central creases. Arguably even more interesting is the rear end treatment, which features these claw-shaped lamps that are LED illuminated on most models. And they come connected by this central strip that aims to emphasize the bodywork's 30 millimeter increase in width. Lower reflectors on both sides are flanked by super slim corner cutouts. And there's a subtle roof spoiler. So different is all of this from what went before that it's something of a surprise to find out that this third generation BC 3 Series model sits on basically the same all steel chassis as its GB Series predecessor, although Hyundai has stretched it and shaved 4% from the platform weight. Overall though, a big step forward has been taken outside, so time to see how adventurous Hyundai's been with the design inside the cabin. At first glance, there's not as much to catch the eye as there was outside when you greeted the car on first acquaintance, but start to look around and clear advances do begin to become evident, which you'll uh, particularly notice if you remember the comparatively cheap feeling cabins of the previous generation i20 models. Uh, this interior certainly isn't the last word when it comes to quality, uh, we're going to get to that, but the standardization of this 10.25 inch digital instrument binnacle screen delivers a high tech ambiance which makes, say, a Fiesta feel rather old school. Uh, that feature, which is first in segment across the range, would have looked rather incongruous inside the previous generation model, but the uh, sculptural fascia here with its smart horizontal blades which stretch right across the dash makes its inclusion seem appropriate, uh, particularly when it's paired with this 10.25 inch center console display. Uh, not all i20s get this. There's a smaller and less sophisticated eight inch monitor with base trim, but it's certainly worth having for the way that it brings something of a 
big car feel to this ambitious little super mini. Uh, we have seen better integrated infotainment screen design uh, than this is, but at least this display here has now been moved to the top of the dash where it's more in your line of sight rather than as before uh, being in the middle of the fascia where you often had to look away from the road to look at it. As usual with Hyundai monitors of this sort, there are clear, neat graphics and helpfully large lower shortcut buttons. Although we would ideally also like to have seen the brand incorporate the kind of useful lower iDrive style controller by the gear stick, uh, the sort of thing that you get in a rival Mazda 2. Uh, there are two main pages on the menu for this bigger touchscreen, one simple uncluttered one with temperature, audio and navigation, or you can swipe across to a display that's full of icons, all of which can be uh, moved about to your preferences, um, rather like the home screen on your smartphone. Either way, uh, you'll have the expected navigation, phone and media options, plus a six-speaker DAB audio system and the usual Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone projection features too. Although, curiously, the uh, latter phone mirroring system, that's only wireless with the smaller monitor that's used with base SE connect trim. There is also a climate section, although fortunately not at the expense of physical buttons. Those are provided further down this centre stack here. Uh, the screen climate menu adds useful auto dehumidify and auto defog functions. Hyundai is also keen, you should know, that uh, this monitor incorporates their latest Blue Link connected car services. Now these uh, provide live information and control of the car via an app. You can access various Blue Link options via this display too. There's a calendar, weather reports and info on vehicle diagnostics, plus also incorporated Hyundai Live services alert you to speed cameras and provide accurate information on traffic jams and roadworks. We're not so keen on the voice recognition setup, which can't manage something as basic as finding you your favorite radio station. Uh, there are, though, some really nice extra screen touches that we do like here. There's an icon which allows you to record voice memos, for example. So if you think of something when you're driving, uh, which you don't want to forget, then you don't have to uh, reach for your phone illegally or stop and write it down. And there's an intriguing section Hyundai calls Sounds of Motion, which is a bit like one of those apps that you can get that help to send you to sleep at night. Uh, this feature, of course, is intended to have the opposite effect via six different options. Uh, lively forest, calm ocean waves and snowy village are uh, all quite soothing, but we can't really understand why you'd want to have rainy day or open air cafe. The latter is complete with people shouting and congested traffic noises, or indeed warm fireplace, because that creates the rather unnerving impression that something uh, in the engine bay up front has ignited. The second of the two new fascia screens we mentioned earlier on is slightly less sophisticated. Hyundai calls the 10.25 inch LCD display that you view through this now smarter four spoke steering wheel, the digital supervision cluster. That sounds uh, quite grand, but actually it isn't because unlike some of the competitor digital instrument monitors, it can't offer a full screen with GPS map viewing option. Still, it is better than the digital screen you get in the larger i30. Here, the two main dials are of the virtual rather than the analog kind, and that means that they can change in color and style with your drive mode selection. At the bottom of the display is a theoretically useful, although in practice rather distracting band that shows your ever-changing level of current economy. Uh, the center section of the screen, that's customizable in three sections via steering wheel buttons. Uh, you can show navigation arrows or a compass. There's a drive assist menu with speed limit info, uh, camera safety stuff, and an attention level indicator showing when you took your last break. Or alternatively, there's uh, another car menu which offers the choice of an energy flow monitor to show how the mild hybrid system's working, or a digital speedo, trip computer data, or a rather pointless display that shows how long the stop-start system has been operational for. 
What else? Uh, well, the seats don't look especially inviting and they lack lumbar support, even on plush variants, but they do offer reasonable lower back and side support and achieving a reasonable level of comfort is fairly easy. That's thanks to plenty of cushion and wheel adjustment. Uh, we'd prefer a backrest adjustment wheel rather than this lower lever, though. Uh, All-round visibility is now usefully improved. It's one of the things, actually, that makes this car so easy to drive for first-timers. Thin A-pillars give you a wide view at junctions, while the now lower belt line and the little quarter window set into the rear C-pillars help your vision at the rear. And uh, just in case, rear sensors and a reversing camera do come as standard across the range. Now, this camera has a particularly neat extra option, which allows you to view the ground directly as you reverse uh, if you're worried that you might be just about to run over something. Build quality as usual with Hyundai, is excellent and the various fittings seem to have been well screwed together by the Turkish factory and that slightly makes up for the fact that a lot of the cabin fittings feel cheap, especially the door handles and the door bins. You don't necessarily expect soft touch plastics in a Super Mini, although some rivals are starting to offer them, but most rivals do a better job of disguising hard, brittle surfaces than this. Uh, the light grey lower finish of this car's interior doesn't help in that regard. Still, at least there's no piano black trim to get all scratched and covered with hairs. Cabin practicality, uh, that is reasonable with a big glove box and properly sized cup holders next to this, uh, thankfully, manual handbrake. A deep storage box is positioned further back here between the seats, but it does lack the connectivity ports, which would allow you to uh, charge your smartphone inside away from prying eyes. Those ports uh, sit above this deep backlit well at the base of the center stack. Uh, you get a 12 volt socket plus a couple of USB-A points. The door bins, they are of a reasonable size and they have angled bottle holders, plus you get a ticket clip in the driver's sun visor. Right, time to move to the rear. You'd expect the i20 to fare pretty well here because it's always been one of the larger models in the class and this third generation design has 10 millimeters of extra length between the axles. Access isn't quite as good as it was with the previous generation model because of this lower roof height, but the doors do open nice and wide. Once inside, you'll find that this Hyundai has as much rear seat space for legs and knees as you could reasonably expect in this class. Only Skoda's Fabia, uh, Sets Ibiza and Volkswagen's Polo match it in this regard. And popular contenders in this sector like Ford's Fiesta, Renault's Clio and the Vauxhall Corsa are noticeably more cramped. Headroom isn't quite so noteworthy, that's thanks to the tapering rear roof line, but the wider exterior that we referenced earlier on and the relatively low central transmission tunnel uh, now means it's a bit more realistic to take a trio of passengers back here if you absolutely had to, although this uh, raised central cushion won't do much for the comfort of the unfortunate middle occupant. What else? Um, well, it's a bit mean of Hyundai to only offer a seat back pocket on the front passenger side. Uh, there's only one grab handle coat hook too. Still, the door pockets, they're reasonably large. They'll take a 500 mil bottle of water. And uh, useful touches include a USB A port below this central cubby here and little side slots to put your belt buckle in when you're not using it. Let's finish this section with a look in the boot. Lift the hatch and you're greeted with one of the more accommodating luggage areas uh, in this segment. 352 litres in size, that's 26 litres larger than before. Uh, to give you some segment perspective, that's about the same as is offered by a Volkswagen Polo, but it's 60 litres more than you'll get in a Fiesta. In fact, it's only 43 litres smaller than the boot you'll get from the Hyundai i30 in the next class up. Uh, there'd certainly be no problem in taking something like a baby buggy because the trunk area itself is broad, deep and well shaped. We also like uh, the way that a channel is provided which enables the parcel shelf to be slid vertically behind the rear seat back when you're not using it. 
There's a boot light, a bag hook and four tie down points in what Hyundai calls a luggage board. This is supposed to be an adjustable height boot floor, but it seems to have been uh, designed without very much thought for the fact that uh, unlike other mild hybrid super minis, this i20 puts its system battery in the spare wheel well uh, beneath this floor, which uh, not only prevents you from having a spare wheel, but of course it also uh, impedes the movement of this luggage board. One day a super mini maker will offer the flexibility of either a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 seat back split, but that day hasn't yet come. So there's just this conventional 60-40 split backrest and that lowers to reveal an 1165 litre total capacity. There's a price tag for style and technology and that fact becomes clear with a quick scan of the pricing applied to this third generation i20. From launch, the least you'll pay at entry level was around £19,000 and at the time of this test in summer 2021, typical volume variants like this one were selling in the £21,000 to £23,500 bracket. The flagship i20N hot hatch meanwhile was launched with a £25,000 price tag. It's all a big step away from the 14 to 19,000 pound price span, which applied the last time we tested the facelifted second generation version of this model as recently as 2018. But sophistication certainly doesn't come cheap, and that's certainly what you get beneath the bonnet this time around. The i20 becomes the first super mini in the sector to offer all its volume variants with mild hybrid 48 volt electrification. Now we'll cover off what this actually means in our driving and cost sections. But suffice to say here that you shouldn't get too carried away with the benefits that this might bring. So what's actually on offer this time around is uh, very much the same three cylinder, one litre TGDI petrol power plant, which was available in nicer versions of the previous generation model. Here it comes in two forms, either with 100 PS for the mainstream SE Connect, premium and ultimate trim levels, or with 120 PS for the sportier N-Line model. Although for one of those, uh, you're going to be looking at well over £22,000. Whatever state of engine tune or trim level you choose, there's the option of 7 DCT automatic transmission for £1,250 more. In concert with the current segment Zeitgeist, diesel power has now been banished from the i20 lineup, and the UK importers aren't even bothering to import baseline variants fitted with the non electrified 1.2 litre MPI four cylinder petrol engine, which featured in the previous design, which in some ways is a pity because uh, provision of that unit it would have given the range a much more attractive entry pricing point. This third generation i20 has a lot more in-house competition than its predecessors ever had, most notably from the small SUV that Hyundai sells, which is entirely based on it, the Banyan, uh, identically powered and spec versions of which sell for only £1,500 more. It's also worth pointing out that the price gap between this super mini and the brand's larger i30 family hatch has now narrowed to not much more than a couple of thousand. And if you happen to want the uprated 120 PS version of the one litre engine, it's actually cheaper to get it with the i30 body style. If you primarily want a super mini though, those observations are going to be largely irrelevant. You might though be interested to learn that all the same engineering that's provided here can be delivered by this i20's direct cousin, the Kia Rio. Now the Rio range only gets the 48 volt, one litre power plant with the top trim levels, but a Rio of that kind in plush three spec still costs only around 500 pounds more than a base SE Connect i20. The Rio, though, is an older, less stylish design, so it depends on what you want. If what you want is a class competitive super mini, then prior to looking at this Hyundai, you'll probably have considered the nation's favourite small hatch, the Ford Fiesta. Now, like the Rio, that car initially looks a lot cheaper than an i20, but that's only because baseline versions get engines with old-fashioned, non-electrified technology. A Fiesta with a comparable mild hybrid unit actually costs very much the same as an i20, and actually probably a bit more if you take spec levels into account. Although, to be fair, the 125 PS Ford power plant has a bit more grunt than the one used in common versions of this Hyundai.
Amongst other super mini segment rivals, at the time of this test in summer 2021, only two others featured mild hybrid engine tech, although we expect that to quickly change. And the models in question, the Suzuki Swift and the Mazda 2, aren't really directly comparable to the i20 because they use lower output engines, 84 PS for the Suzuki and either 75 or 90 PS for the Mazda. If you don't care about that, then you could conceivably be paying in the 13 to 16,000 pound bracket for the Swift and in the 16,500 to 90,000 pound bracket for the Mazda. The word hybrid is banded about by other brands in this segment, but only currently anyway in connection with full hybrid power plants. They differ from the kind of mild hybrid tech we have here because they're a good deal more sophisticated and they're able to run independently on battery power for short periods. But of course, that kind of technology comes with higher price tags. Uh, the three cars in question, the Honda Jazz, the Toyota Yaris, and the Renault Clio E-Tech, they all have starting prices in the 19 to 20,000 pound bracket, but you'll probably need to spend a couple of thousand more than that to get a spec level comparable to that of a base i20. As for the more conventional super mini models we haven't mentioned, well, comparable versions of Peugeot's 208 are slightly more expensive than this Hyundai, as is also the case with variants of the Skoda Fabia, uh, the Seat Ibiza, and the Volkswagen Polo uh, offering more than 95 PS. Even with the VW Group's core 95 PS 1 litre TSI engine, neither of the Fabia, the Ibiza, or the Polo will save you very much over an i20. But of course, there are cars in the segment that will. Uh, you'll save a little over this Korean car by choosing a comparable TCE engine Renault Clio or a comparable PureTech engine Vauxhall Corsa and a lot more if you opt for a comparable version of a Citroen C3 or a Nissan Micra. And of course, if you really want to save, then there are the real bargain basement brand models, the MG3 and the Dacia Sandero, but there you very definitely get what you don't pay for. Finally, a word on the standalone i20N hot hatch variant. At first, its £25,000 price tag makes it look a fair bit pricier than its arch rival, Ford's Fiesta ST, which in comparable five-door form was, at the time of this test, priced from around £22,500. But that's only because Hyundai doesn't offer an entry-level spec on the i20N in the way that Ford does. A comparably equipped ST3 spec to Fiesta ST is almost identically priced to an i20N, which of course isn't a coincidence. Uh, there isn't really any other five-door super mini in the segment with the firepower to compete with those two models. Here though, our focus is on the mainstream i20 models and if, when you finished with price and product comparisons, you're still tempted by what this Hyundai has to offer, then you'll want to know exactly what is going to be included for your money. Well, a pretty reasonable amount as it happens. Uh, even entry double SE Connect variants, they get 16 inch alloy wheels, automatic headlamps with high beam assist, uh, rear parking sensors, there's a perimeter alarm, and there's some significant electronic camera driven safety features too. We're going to cover those off for you in just a few minutes. Inside with SE Connect spec, the big ticket item is the 10.25 inch digital supervision cluster instrument binnacle screen with its virtual dials. Plus there's air conditioning, uh, cruise control with a speed limiter, a drive mode select driving mode system, a leather stitch steering wheel and an adjustable height luggage board uh, for the boot. Infotainment is taken care of by an 8-inch center dash center console display touchscreen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, uh, plus a rear view camera, Bluetooth, voice recognition and the DAB audio system uh, with a pair of speakers front and rear. That's along with two tweeters. We were a bit surprised to find though uh, that height adjustable front seat belts and a central armrest were missing at this level. Both of those features make an appearance elsewhere in the range though. If you want a bit more in terms of equipment, then you'll be encouraged to find the £2,200 premium that Hyundai wants, which will upgrade you to the premium level of trim that we've been trying here. That gets you lots of extra niceties, of course. Larger 17-inch alloy wheels, full LED MFR headlamps, LED rear combination tail lamps, uh, rear privacy glass, power folding door mirrors and auto wipers. 
Inside, premium spec gets you heated front seats, dual zone air conditioning, a heated steering wheel, blue interior mood lighting, and the useful auto defog system, which uh, more quickly clears the windscreen on misty days. The key upgrade you get with premium spec though lies with cabin screen tech. The center console display grows to 10.25 inches in size. It gains navigation, cloud-based natural language voice recognition, and a full suite of Hyundai's Blue Link telematic services with a five-year subscription. Uh, you can access the various Blue Link options via the central display. There's a calendar, weather reports, and info on vehicle diagnostics too. You get a voice memo option and the sounds of nature feature, which pipes soothing sounds into the cabin. And the screens uh, incorporated Hyundai Live Services alert you to speed cameras, and they provide accurate information on traffic jams and roadworks. Plus, there's also a downloadable Hyundai Blue Link app via which, using your smartphone, of course, you can remotely lock or unlock the car and you can be advised if the alarm goes off too. Using the app via your phone, you can also access maintenance info on your i20. You can send places of interest data to the car's navigation system and you can find the vehicle in a crowded car park if you've gone and forgotten where you parked it. The other two mainstream i20 variants prioritise respectively either luxury or sportiness. If you favour luxury, you'll be directed to the fully tinseled up ultimate level of spec. This is the only model in the mainstream range which is fitted with the trendy contrast colour black roof which fashionistas tend to want. Uh, that's complemented in this case by a black glossy finish for the radiator grille and for the door mirrors and chromed window surrounds too. Plus, there's also a bit of extra camera safety tech that we'll cover off for you in just a moment. Uh, inside, Ultimate Spec gives you a Bose premium sound system with a subwoofer, a wireless phone charging pad, keyless entry, and the unique black and grey interior finish. Your alternative at the top of the range is Sporty N-Line trim, which, as we said earlier, gets you the uprated 120 PS version of the 1.0-litre TGDI petrol engine. At this level, there's a choice of either 17-inch N-Line exclusive design wheels or larger 18-inch rims. The interior is lifted by black N-Line trim with red accents and N-Line branding for the leather-wrapped steering wheel and for the gear knob. And as with Ultimate Spec, there's a wireless phone charging pad and keyless entry included. That only leaves the full-fat sporting model, the Ballistic i20N. Here you get bespoke matte grey 18-inch uh, alloy wheels shod with sticky Pirelli tyres and featuring red calipers for the end performance braking system. There's also a full body kit, while the cabin gets race-style heated part leather N-line sports seats, aluminium sports pedals and a black roof liner, plus all the features from N-line trim too. There's a unique version of the 10.25-inch instrument cluster display and a central infotainment screen of the same size, which is where you access the many performance presets of the Hyundai N-Grip control system. Other drive features include launch control, an N-corner carving differential for extra traction through the turns, and a sound generator too to emphasize the meaty exhaust note. Right, that's talked you through the i20 lineup and briefed you on the key mainstream model equipment features. But what about options? Well, as usual with Hyundai, there aren't that many. Uh, the brand believes instead that customers will prefer to move up a trim level rather than go box ticking. You can add some useful practical items, though, uh, like a liner or a mat for the boot area and floor mats, too, of the velour or rubber kind. i20 branded entry guards are available, too. For the few i20 customers who like the max power look, there are sport stripes available and you can also add phantom black trim to the rear bumper and to the front lamps. And of course, there are a wide range of optional metallic paint colours. We have intense blue here. Uh, you'll probably need to budget for one of these because the, uh, the only standard shade is solid polar white. Annoyingly though, you can't order the contrast colour roof as an option with uh, SE Connect or with premium trim. 
Let's finish with the perusal of the safety stuff on offer. Hyundai claims to have considerably improved its smart sense package of camera safety features for this third generation i20 and to now offer what it calls the most comprehensive safety package in the segment. Uh, close inspection of the small print though uh, reveals that as usual all the choicest elements only appear with the priciest trim levels. Still all i20s meet the class standard in this regard and that means of course uh, that an autonomous emergency braking system uh, that comes now as standard. Although with the two most affordable trim levels this cannot specifically detect pedestrians or cyclists. Otherwise though it's the usual setup which, as you drive, scans the road ahead, searching for potential collision hazards. If one's detected, uh, you'll be warned. Now, if you don't respond, uh, or perhaps you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied, and that's to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. The other noteworthy standard fit camera driven feature is the lane departure warning system with lane keep assist setup. Now this will warn you if the car is unintentionally wandering over a road marking before gently steering your i20 back to where it ought to be. Uh, there's also driver attention alert which monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness and high beam assist which automatically dips the headlights in the face of oncoming traffic. Other standard safety features are more familiar. There are twin front side and curtain airbags and they're linked to an e-call emergency button system which will alert the rescue services with your exact GPS location if they go off in a crash. You also get Isofix rear child seat fastenings and active front head restraints which prevent whiplash. In addition, as usual with a super mini of this kind, there's ESC electronic stability control, tyre pressure monitoring and hill start assist control too to stop the car from rolling backwards as you pull away on inclines. As you'd also expect in this segment, the ABS anti-lock brakes are aided in panic stops by a brake assist feature. Plus there's an emergency stop signal and that flashes the hazard lights to warn following motorists. If you want more, you'll have to stretch further up the range. N-Line trim adds specific pedestrian and cyclist detection for the autonomous braking system. And Ultimate Spec further adds two additional camera-driven features. The first is blind spot collision warning, which works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out if there's a vehicle in your blind spot. And then there's the one really new key safety feature added to the Smart 3 i20, lane follow assist. Now here, smart sensors and the forward-facing camera detect when the car drifts out of the centre of its lane and applies a steering torque to hold road positioning for safety. The car also estimates the trajectory of the vehicle ahead and adjusts its position accordingly. It's all very reassuring. Hyundai is progressing its engine technology in leaps and bounds. Uh, shortly after the previous second generation version of this i20 first arrived back in 2015, uh, this model line was embellished with the brand's latest TGDI tech, including a standardized ISG intelligent stop and go system and a downsized three cylinder, one liter petrol unit, uh, the one we're trying here in fact. For this third generation design, all of that has been further embellished with the brand's latest 48 volt electrified mild hybrid tech, which lightly tinsels this 998cc power plant with a tiny lithium ion battery, which just about justifies the electrified hybrid marketing spiel. Unlike a self-charging full hybrid engine, the sort of thing that you get in this class with uh, a Toyota Yaris or a Honda Jazz, and the sort of thing that Hyundai itself offers on its comparably priced Kona SUV, mild hybrid engines of the sort now fitted to this i20 can't ever run independently on battery power. Instead, with this kind of setup, a belt-driven integrated starter generator replaces the standard alternator and enables the recovery and storage of energy that's usually lost during braking and coasting to charge a tiny 48 volt lithium ion air cooled battery pack. And the starter generator also acts as a motor integrating with the engine and using the stored energy uh, to provide extra pulling power during normal driving and acceleration, as well as running the vehicle's electrical ancillaries and also helping the power plant's stop start system in urban traffic. 
Measuring the difference all this makes to fuel and CO2 readings is difficult because since we last tested this car, the industry has switched to a completely new WLTP cycle of efficiency measurement. Uh, based on our experience with similar mild hybrid tech though in other models, uh, a number of this Hyundai's competitors also now offer that, uh, we would put the efficiency claims at between 3 to 4 percent and that's the kind of improvement that the brand itself claims has been achieved here which means that we can classify its benefit as marginal but worth having. Uh, you'll want to know how that pans out in terms of the actual figures that you'll be budgeting with and taxed on though. Well, for the base 100 PS version of the 1 litre TGDI unit we're trying here, you're looking at up to 55.4 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 115 grams per kilometre of CO2. Uh, the returns, quite impressively, being almost identical regardless of your choice between manual or automatic transmission. Uh, they're pretty much the same with the uprated 120 PS version of the same engine too. The figures there are 53.3 mpg and 120 grams per kilometre for both manual and auto models. Clearly all those readings assume engagement of the most frugal eco driving mode. Uh, obviously the 1.6 litre four cylinder petrol engine in the wild i20N hot hatch is nothing like as frugal and clean as that. Uh, it returns up to 40.4 mpg and up to 158 grams per kilometre of CO2. Although if you ever got anywhere near those figures in normal ownership of an i20N we'd really question why you bothered to buy it in the first place. For the mainstream 1 litre TGDI models, the efficiency figures we've just quoted mean a typical 28% BIK taxation rate, although higher spec DCT auto variants stray up to the 29% bracket. Either way, there'll be a first year VED tax bill of £165 for all 1 litre I-20s, uh, with £140 payable per year thereafter. What else might you need to know? Uh, residual values, well, they're a lot higher than they used to be on mainstream Hyundai models. Uh, the previous generation model managed 37 to 39% after three years of use. That was slightly below the class average, but we'd expect this much improved Mark III design to match its mainstream competitors here. Uh, industry experts are talking 46% after three years, and that's close to the 48% that you get from a VW Polo, and way better than the 38% you get from a Fiesta. As usual with Hyundai, a strong buying incentive is the five-year unlimited mileage warranty, which comes as standard. It's backed up by breakdown cover, which lasts the same length of time, and free annual vehicle health checks too over that duration. True, rival brand Kia claims to better that package by offering a similar seven-year deal, but there you're limited to 100,000 miles. As for servicing, well, your i20 will need a garage visit every year or every 10,000 miles, whichever comes around soonest. If you want to budget ahead for routine maintenance, there are various Hyundai Sense packages which offer fixed price servicing over two, three or five year periods. You can pay for your plan monthly and you can add MOTs into the three or five year plans for an extra fee. The final financial consideration is insurance. Uh, ratings have been set a fraction higher than some rivals and for some reason they're higher for manual transmission than for automatics. Uh, the ratings start at Group 12E or 13E for base SE connector trim. It's 14 or 16E for this premium spec and 15E or 16E for plusher ultimate trim. The top i20N hot hatch, that's right up at Group 27A. There's something old and something new here. Some of the old virtues that have always characterized Hyundai's products remain. Some welcome, some not so much. In the plus column come strong equipment levels, build quality, and the kind of almost unimpeachable reliability which allows the brand to offer what, arguably, is a class-leading warranty. Perhaps a bit less welcome is the relative lack of engagement that you get at the wheel in the mainstream variants. Uh, the Koreans still have a little way to go to match class-leading Ford and VW Group Super Minis in that regard, although the crackerjack dynamics of the flagship i20N hot hatch show that Hyundai can deliver handling excellence when it chooses to. 
As for the new stuff, well, again, some things are welcome, some not so much. Welcome is the sharper and more dynamic styling, makes this the first design in this model line with true pavement presence and aesthetic showroom appeal. The improved standards of safety and media connectivity also fall into that plus column. And it's no mean achievement to be first in segment with the standard fitment across the range of mild hybrid engine tech and a digitalized instrument binnacle screen. We are less impressed by the significant price increase that all that technology brings with it. Although keen finance deals and strong residuals will still leave this car looking reasonable value on finance or when you take whole life costs into account. Ultimately, one statistic tells you a lot about this i20. 88% of existing owners buy another, a figure almost double that of typical rivals in the segment. Evidently then, people like it once they've tried it. And after living with one, you can see why. Certainly, it's hard to think of a super mini which would be easier to fit into your life than this one. Few others are more practical, better built, or as easy to drive. Of course, as we've been saying, this third generation i20, although it's vastly improved, is still far from being perfect, and your choices under the bonnet are rather limited. Really, there does need to be more than just that single one litre mainstream engine with its two outputs. We would have liked to have seen the option, for example, of the full hybrid power plant that Hyundai offers in the Kona small SUV. Overall, though, there really aren't too many cars in this class that make much more sense when you add together all the really important attributes that families look for from a super mini in this segment. And these are, after all, times that, more than ever, call for sensible decisions. Like purchase of an i20? Well, if you are target market for this car and you trouble yourself to get to know it a bit, it's quite possible that you might well think so.